Welcome back to Foreign Correspondents. I'm Sami Sorang with our panel of foreign journalists. Thank you for being here. Hi, Ms. Thank, Thank you for having us. us. Cross-border cooperation and exchanges are gaining traction following the Inter-Korean summits and the Pyongyang-Washington summit. So in which areas do you expect to see the most strong cooperation? So far, there is a problem of sanctions. So because of the sanctions that are still in place, I think economic cooperation will have to wait a little bit. Right. Uh, but there is one area that I, I expect quite some is um, tourism. Mm -hmm. because tourism is still not included in the current sanctions and North Korea obviously really wants to restart its tourism project. So that's one area I will personally look okay. in the coming week, month. All right. And Jason? I think sports uh, cooperation is making a lot of progress already. Just in June, uh, North and South Korea announced that they will field uh, joint teams during this summer's uh, Asian Games right. in, in Indonesia. There'll be a joint women's basketball team, mm -hmm. a rowing team, a canoeing team. Like in the Pyeongchang Winter Olympics, North and South Korean athletes will march together uh, during the opening and closing ceremonies. Right. Okay. There's also the field of culture and we've seen some cultural exchanges already. For example, the famous um, K-pop concert in Pyongyang. Yeah. I'm sure it would be great if, if there are similar events also in the future. Okay, all right. From economics and tourism all the way to the sports and the arts, this week on Foreign Correspondence, we'll take a look at the multifaceted cooperation between the two Koreas. Inter-Korean economic cooperation is now starting to ride a new wave. Following a high-level meeting between the two Koreas on June 1st, a string of dialogue including military talks and a meeting of athletic officials and Red Cross representatives took place, speeding up the inter-Korean exchanges. And in the midst of these developments, anticipation over inter-Korean economic cooperation is reaching fever pitch. On June 26th, transportation officials from North and South Korea gathered for a cross-border meeting. Meeting at the Peace House on the South Korean side of Panmunjom, they agreed to push forward in reconnecting a railway between the two sides, as well as modernizing North Korea's aging rail network. If the inter-Korean rail connection is restored, among other benefits, a notable boost in the shipment of cargo and tourism could be expected. And this in turn could reshape the logistics network of the wider Northeast Asian region, as it would incur large savings both in time and cost for cargo being transported to and from China and Russia. Meanwhile, questions are also being raised on the possibility of reopening the Kaesong Industrial Complex and the resumption of tourism to Mount Kumgang, in anticipation of the growing economic exchanges between the two Koreas. Inter-Korean economic exchanges and cooperation may accelerate even further as North Korea continues on its current path of moving forward with denuclearization and economic development. Okay, so let me begin with this question. What specifically do you think Kim Jong-un is trying to achieve through these economic uh, cooperation? Uh, global recognition. He wants North Korea to be seen as a normal country with a functioning economy, uh, but yet still be able to hold on to his rule. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think he does one as well. I think he genuinely wants to develop its economy and there is so many areas, I mean, everything has to be rebuilt in, right. in North Korea, there is so many uh, things to be done. And what's interesting is when he met uh, Moon Jae-in during the summit in April, he mentioned specifically the poor condition of the road right. and the railroad. 
And it's true that like, in North Korea that's a really a big problem and, and there is as well the problem of the power grids. Mm -hmm. So this kind of thing where South Korea could invest and develop, uh, you need the infrastructure to, if you want to develop the economy. Right. Uh, so I, I think that in terms, for example, power grids and railroad, this is really some sector that we could see some cooperation pretty soon. And actually we already see there is already, already there was some discussion about uh, reconnecting and modernization of the, the railroads. Mm -hmm. And what about South Korea? What can South Korea uh, gain from economic cooperation? I mean, they also have a lot to gain. I mean, for South Korea, for South Korean companies, uh, the North Korean uh, labor market is, mm -hmm. I mean, full of uh, relatively well qualified, uh, cheap labor, mm -hmm. and also at least they're perceived as um, harder working than other, let, let's say, um, workers from uh, other countries. But I mean, of course, there's a moral aspect to it. I mean, let's say if South Korea would uh, hire um, North Korean workers, if they would get visas and would get some training here, I mean, every foreign worker, uh, North Korean foreign worker, has to give the large share of his um, salary to, to the state. Right. So basically, um, you can call them slave labor. Mm -hmm. But it's not so black and white. Within the North Korean population, people would pay bribes uh, to get this position um, because still they would earn relatively more. So it's, it's hard to judge about that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so through these joint economic ventures, it's inevitable that the average North Korean citizen would be more exposed to the workings of a capitalistic economy. Do you think this is a concern for Kim Jong-un at this point? North Korea has already had uh, capitalistic influence uh, taking place for many years mm -hmm. now. There is a thriving black market right. in North Korea. North Koreans know what capitalism is. Is it a threat to the regime? to a degree, uh, but it seems to have tolerated these black markets thus far. Right. And if you look at Kaesong, the joint uh, industrial complex mm -hmm. of Kaesong, where the Korean from South and North worked together for 10 years, I think the influence of uh, Kaesong, right. the, this activity did not really undermine the ideology and the regime, so mm -hmm. I think now Kim Jong-un can feel pretty comfortable that he can have some cooperation with North Korea without risking his grip on, on power. Right. But it did at least introduce North Korea to South Korean choco pies, <laughs> uh, which were given to Kaesong employees, which were then later traded on the black market. Right. Yeah. Okay, now Fred, you actually spent time in North Korea. Mm -hmm. So during your time, what did you learn about the North Korean economy? Like, how is it different from the one down here in South? I was in North Korea as a humanitarian worker, so obviously you don't have as much access as you want, and mm -hmm. it's not like I was living in the middle of North Korean people. Right. Uh, but just as an external visitor, you do see a lot of black markets, mm -hmm. including in the streets of Pyongyang. You have the official market, and then next to it, you see a lot of people selling the product they make. For, for example, at night, you can see a lot of ajumas, like a Korean middle-aged women, who sell little bread, tofu that they make themselves. That was 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. so you, already 10 years ago, you see all this private market activity on the grassroots level. So you have all these private economies that is somehow inside the, the state's um, structure. Mm -hmm. so as uh, my NGO, we, for example, when we rebuilt some hospital, we ask different companies, North Korean companies, mm -hmm. Uh, we start a bidding process. We want to, to hire the cheapest one. So right. there is, there is, it's a kind of a competition mm -hmm. when you ask different North Korean companies to give you a price. And we could see how these companies were fighting to get the contract. Uh -huh. So there is already, even 10 years ago, there was some kind of internal competition between the North Korean companies. So I, I, my assumption is that this really developed. It's much, much more developed right now. Right. Now, Fabian, Germany provides a good model for us in mm. that Germany was also <laughs> once a divided nation. What kind of economic cooperation did you see between the East and the West? Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, there was nothing uh, exactly like uh, Kaesong, but mm -hmm. um, there was always inter-German um, economic cooperation. We have to see the first uh, 12 years or so um, uh, after East and Ger West Germany established, there was not yet a wall separating the country, so the, the borders were not as sealed yet. So, for example, there would be East Germans uh, working in West German factories or so. That, that happened. And then after the border was sealed, um, uh, it's, for me, it was surprising. I checked the statistics. It didn't really affect the, the trade between the two countries oh. that much. Yeah. For West German law, um, trading with East Germany was not um, foreign trade and it was not domestic uh -huh. trade because um, it was something in between, but there yeah. were no tariffs on it. So, for example, uh, West Germany would give uh, crude oil to East Germany and East Germany would, uh, for example, give agricultural products or meat to, to West Germany. If you look at the statistics, up until the 80s, it was a steady rise, like uh, organic, slow uh, increase of 
trade and it was on a relatively high level and it could also be used as a political uh, leverage and not even the Soviet Union could substitute that for, for uh, East Germany. So in, East, in the East German socialist uh, economic model they had a lot of shortages of, of all kind of stuff and West Germany could you know help out. Right, wow. Now, do you think that uh, played a significant part in the eventual reunification because the economic exchanges were so significant? Yeah, to, to some degree, yes. I mean, at that time, there was a lot of debate. Um, should we do that trade or not? Because it would stabilize maybe the regime in yeah. East Germany. But um, I think in retrospect, it was, was a good thing because um, the more trade you have, um, the more also political leverage uh, mm. you have when, you know, for example, cutting off of the trade. I mean, you can basically influence um, each other. And um, in the end, I mean, East Germany basically collapsed, the economy collapsed, and uh, West Germany couldn't prevent that. So it's, uh, but in the end, yeah, I think it was a good, good, good thing, and it helped uh, uh, uni the reunification process. Yeah, okay. Now, coming back to Korea, in what specific ways do you think the economic cooperation between the two Koreas will benefit or prove to be an impediment to the neighboring countries? Any economic cooperation here on the Korean Peninsula uh, could uh, infuriate China. I mean, China, and, and for that matter, Russia, mm -hmm. uh, want to have almost exclusive access to the North Korean market, access to North Korean ports, access to North Korean mineral wealth. So if they perceive that South Korean companies are encroaching on their territory, that could raise some tensions here in mm -hmm. the region. I, I'm not sure I totally agree with you on that one. Uh, I think that China and Russia, the priority now is to stabilize the situation on the Grand Peninsula. I that in recent time, the situation in this region is gradually improving. The contacts of the North Korean 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 cooperation as a stabilizing, fact, a stabilizing factor. The more North Korea is uh, constrained by uh, economic cooperation, by, for example, project like the Kaesong project, I think this is really something that helped to stabilize it. And I think that's something China, Beijing, and Moscow see as, a, as positive. Okay. And they, I mean, they could also benefit from, let's say, if they would make the uh, realized railroad project through North Korea. So, exactly. if, for example, if South Korea would have a, a railroad landline or a gas pipe to Russia or, or, or to, to China, respectively, I mean, that would be a win-win situation for everyone. Yeah. Now, some critics argue that inter-Korean cross-border cooperation, economic cooperation, would undermine the existing U.S. and U.N. sanctions placed on North Korea. What are your thoughts on that? I think the um, South Korea will respect international sanctions. I have no doubt about that. Mm -hmm. So I think South Korea will be very careful in not doing any economic project that would violate sanctions. So I don't think anything, the cooperation that now the two Koreas are discussing, I don't think, I don't see how they would violate sanctions okay. so far. Well, I mean, there was just some satellite imagery released show, uh, recently showing that North Korea is upgrading some of its nuclear uh, reactor facilities. Mm -hmm. uh, and if that were to continue, I mean, really, it all comes down to Washington's decision whether or not to, to one, lift U.S. sanctions, mm -hmm. but also give the green light to lift United Nations sanctions. And if the Trump administration or whatever admin U.S. administration s doesn't feel that North Korea is moving toward complete, verifiable and irreversible denuclearization, these sanctions will probably stay in place. Yeah, right. I mean, first we have to wait after they... I don't think they have to denuclearize completely first, but uh, probably it will be like an, a process that is interactive. So first they, which they have to show some serious commitment, mm -hmm. then there could be like first like loosening of, of sanctions. But I think, uh, as Frederick mentioned, South Korea is very careful um, in like, aligning with the international community on, on the sanctions policy. But if economic um, cooperation between the Koreas would happen, of course they would uh, uh, undermine the sanctions because the whole point of the sanctions is that uh, North Korea is cut off from the, from earning hard currency. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. Now, while we've discussed the economic cooperation between the two Koreas, cross-border exchanges are not just limited to the economy. We're seeing joint activities in the religious, cultural and sports arena as well. Let's take a look. Following the inter-Korean summit as well as the North Korea-US summit, civilian exchanges between the two Koreas have also gained traction. On June 22nd, the two Koreas agreed to hold a family reunion of those separated by the Korean War from August 20th through to 26th at Mount Kumgang. 
This would mark the first inter-Korean family reunion since 2015, and the two sides will each send 100 people to the event. Sports exchanges between the two Koreas have also received the green light. At a meeting of sports representatives from the two sides on June 18, the two Koreas agreed to hold a basketball game for the first time in 15 years, with the first game taking place in Pyongyang on July 4 and the second being held in Seoul sometime in the fall. Also, the two sides agreed to march together at the opening and closing ceremonies of the upcoming 2018 Jakarta Asian Games in August. Meanwhile, on June 24, President Moon Jae-in, who was visiting Russia and watched a World Cup game between South Korea and Mexico, met with FIFA President Gianni Infantino and proposed a joint hosting of the 2030 World Cup between South Korea and North Korea. Elsewhere, civic groups are also pushing forward to hold joint inter-Korean celebrations to mark National Foundation Day and the 100th anniversary of the March 1st movement. Inter-Korean cooperation and exchanges are gaining traction across a diverse array of different areas, and it is hoped that they will serve as an important foundation to bring lasting improvements to cross-border relations. Now, President Moon Jae-in, during his visit to Russia, proposed to co-host the World Cup alongside North Korea. So, how do you see the likelihood of that happening in 2030? 2030 seems uh, pretty implausible. To host the World Cup, you need to accept a lot of uh, tourism at the same time. And right. North Korea, the way they, are, they accept foreigners now is that they control them all the time. You have, they have guides, mm -hmm. translators, and some people say minders with them all the time. I don't see tens of thousands of foreigners suddenly uh, visiting North Korea freely, like visiting Pyongyang and Chongjin and uh, Hamong right. and being free to roam in the country. I mean, I would love that to happen. That would be great. But I'm not sure th North Korea is ready to have this kind of uh, invasion of yeah. uh, foreign visitors. I mean, we know that uh, Pyongyang, for example, holds, has to like the biggest uh, sports stadium mm. in the world but i'm not sure if it would fit to the you know safety regulations right. who knows and then you need uh, like at least in four or five more other cities you need also like football stadiums that uh, can hold a lot of people so that's a big you know question but on the other hand i mean at, at least um sports wise i mean we've seen um at least south korea beating the current uh world champion in, in football. <laughs> Football-wise, uh, yeah, they're good. And, you know, Korean people are relatively passionate ab about uh, football and that yes. uh, would be a good reason also to hold it. Yeah. I think uh, it doesn't mean you have to, they have to split evenly the games. We can have only yeah, sure. some games in Pyongyang okay. and the rest in South Korea. Oh, in that sense, yeah. that would be yeah. possible. Okay, now let's shift gears and talk about the uh, reunions of families separated by the Korean War. If we have a look at the numbers, 57,000 South Koreans have applied to take part, but only 100 were granted in the August round. So how do you think we should go about having more reunions? There should be more reunions <laughs> every week. Uh, I mean, this is something that it's ridiculous that North Korea has for decades uh, dangled the promise of reunions over the heads of South Koreans. So the South Korean Red Cross, the South Korean government has always pushed to have these reunions for these families that have been divided since the time of the Korean War. But it's North Korea that always pulls back and always requires the reunions to take place in North Korean territory, or there were some examples of video conferences. Mm -hmm. I mean, if I've always felt that if North Korea is really serious about improving ties with, North, with South Korea, then these family reunions should be happening all the time until all 57,000 South Koreans and who knows how many North Korean families are met before it's too late. Right. Yeah, I mean, it, the, in, uh, in August, only 100 families from each side we meet. Uh, yes. It's not enough. And yes. it's only three days meeting, and they're yeah. not allowed to keep in touch to exchange, exchange mm -hmm. email or phone calls. After it's, that, yeah. After yeah. that, it's really not enough. And I hope, I mean, as Jason said, it's North Korea. It's because of North Korea. And I hope, I, th I really hope 
South Korea will push harder. I've spoken to some family members and they were quite disappointed after attending one of those uh, reunions mm -hmm. because you don't get a lot of private time and you're meeting yeah. in this really huge banquet hall mm -hmm. and uh, you're surrounded by mobs of journalists. Mm -hmm. of, of uh, Waiting for you to cry and yeah. shove their camera in your It's face like a performance and, yeah. to, to some degree mm -hmm. and um, you don't really, and after all those decades, um, you don't really know what kind of person is it. Um, I mean, can, can we lose all our masks and like yeah. be very intimate? And I think that's almost impossible in that setting. Right. Mm. I, I mean, I've heard from people who have reunited with their North Korean families, yeah, and come back disappointed because, you know, it turns into a propaganda show that their, their brothers or sisters or whoever from the North, you know, just end up praising you know, this was like Kim Jong Il. This is this is about a decade ago, but um, the, yeah, there, there's a, this performance aspect to it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's contrasted. I, I interview many families who came back from this family reunion. Some people South like Koreans. South Koreans, mm -hmm. of course, South Koreans. Many people are disappointed, as you said, but some other people were very happy, and they say, "Oh, I was able to finally know what happened to my parents. Mm -hmm. I yeah. was able to get news from yeah. my family. I was able. My son was with me. He got in touch with my nephews in North mm -hmm. Korea. So the link is not broken. So yeah. It's not totally bad either. There is some really oh, no, good things. Much better than worse. Yeah, I mean, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Much better than nothing. But it's, it's a tragedy. I mean, you, you want to cry every time you listen to these testimonies. Yeah. It's horrible. Too infrequent and too short, for sure. Yeah. Now, what was the case for Germany? How did the families communicate with each other? Mm -hmm. I mean, you could send mails, for example. Um, there was, was exchange. If you're from the West, you could visit your uh, relatives in the East, um, but you needed a permission, like a special visa. Were they hard to obtain, the visas? I mean, it uh, depends. In the beginning, it was, for example, it was only granted during Christmas time or so. It was very h high regulated, but in the end, it was more relaxed, and then you, you, you could basically go and visit your relatives. The other way around it was much more difficult, not impossible, but uh, you had to come from a political trusted background, a right. few uh, East German, to basically go to the West. Yeah, you could visit your relatives. Yeah. Okay. Now, our main tourism venture is the Mount Kumgang project. Mm -hmm. From your time in North Korea, do you see any other places becoming a tourist hotspot? Yeah, there is one, uh, actually, the um, East coast in North Korea is actually it's really beautiful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, for example, in Hamong, there are some beaches that are gorgeous. It's beautiful. Donald Trump thinks so too. Yeah, yeah. yeah, but you know what? I thought of that when Donald Trump said, oh, uh, there is a lo lot yeah. of potential. He was right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He's exactly right. Like these places yeah. could become huge tourist hotspots. Right. Wonsan is a pretty nice city. There is nice beaches too, the nice seashores. All this East Coast has a lot of potential. Oh, okay. Now, if you had a chance to go to North Korea freely, where would you like to visit? I like mountains and, and hiking, so I would like to go to Paekdusan, Mount Paektu, which uh, has a lot of significance in both North and South Korean mm -hmm. uh, history and culture. Uh, there was a good documentary out a few years ago by Werner Herzog mm -hmm. uh, that featured Paekdusan in it. Uh, so I've been to the Chinese side of the mountain, uh, so I'd like to go to see the, the North Korean okay, side. I mean, I'm super interested in how the uh, people live outside of Pyongyang. And since I interviewed many, many refugees who come from the Chongjin area, I would uh, like to v visit that city. I mean, it's, it's as far as you can get from Pyongyang. It's supposed to be relatively free because the control from the party, from the centralized state is, uh, you know, they basically cannot reach so close. Uh, uh, to, to that part, it's heavy industrialized. Mm -hmm. it's, it has a rough climate, but supposedly also has some like you know ni nice industrial charm. It has some uh, beaches. So I mean, yeah, I would be really curious to go there. Were there any tourism exchanges between the east and the west Germany? Yeah, yeah there was. There was. I mean, uh, the in, in in East Germany, there was one uh, common joke among the people, and they said Walter Ulbricht, the head of the state of East, east Germany, he was holding a prize competition for its citizen for whatever reason and the first prize was one free week of travel to to uh, within east germany the second pr uh, prize were two weeks of free travel in east germany <laughs> okay. and the third prize were three uh, free weeks of travel and um german humor is not the best but you know you <laughs> get the message um, it's the service sector i mean the mentality in a socialist state it's different like you right. you for example if as a tourist if you go there and you want like let's say your coffee with milk, but you know, in, on the menu it is not listed, then they would be totally inflexible. I mean, there are like uh -huh. horror stories about that. Then also for foreign tourists in East Germany, it was much more expensive. You didn't pay the local prices, right. but uh, a special price. 
But you know, I checked the numbers. For example, in 1984, there were like uh, almost 200,000 uh, West Germans visiting as a tourist to uh, go to East Germany. Um, but it was the main motivation was the curiosity, uh, like look behind the curtain and see how people in a different uh, system live. And I think that also plays the biggest role why people go to North Korea. Yeah. This curiosity. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, what kind of activities do you think we need to see? To, in order to ensure that these cooperations keep going forward. Denuclearization is really the key. You, cannot, you can go up until a point with the North Korea in terms of cooperation. Uh, if there is no denuclearization, we will uh, hit a wall. Okay. We'll have to wrap it up there. Do you have any final comments, Jason? I do hope in relations improve between North and South Korea. I do feel there needs to be more tangible developments made, especially from the North Korean side, to either denuclearize, hold family reunions, show that it really is interested in, in changing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, from a journalist point of view, uh, I want to go to North Korea to cover the opening of uh, the reopening of Gangang, of Kaesong. Right. So uh, I hope this cooperation will continue. That's more work for us. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you very much for your Thank insight. Thank you very much for joining Thank me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, there's a wide variety of cross-border exchanges in the pipeline for the second half of 2018, and we hope these exchanges and cooperation keep continuing on into the future. That's all the time we have for today. Thank you for tuning in and goodbye. <laughs>